Welcome, lovely to be together. I don't know if you've realized the Bible has impacted languages across the world, and of course definitely impacted the English language in many ways. And one of the ways is it's provided the English language with a number of little sayings or idioms, if you want to get the right phrase in there. So some of them you've probably heard before, and a lot of them you think, yes, I think that's from the Bible, but there'll be a couple of surprises. So let me give you some examples. If I say to you, what you sow, you reap, most people know what that means in the English language, and generally most people say, yeah, I think, I think that's from the Bible, you know, somewhere in the New Testament. But then there's other ones that might be a bit of a surprise. How about by the skin of your teeth? That's from Job. Can you believe it? And then Isaiah gives us a couple. He gives us like a, how about drop in the bucket? or there's no rest for the wicked. In case you're wondering why you've been working so hard, the Bible answers that question right there. <laughs> then there's this one, my favorite, another one bites the dust. And you thought that was from Queen. <laughs> no, it was from King, King Solomon, in fact, in Psalm 72. And then there's others, the writings on the wall, some poor Babylonian king got freaked out by God's handwriting. And, She's the salt of the earth, thanks to Shampoo, Lot's wife. But we could go on and on. In fact, you go and check it out for yourself. There's over th another 30 of those. But I want to give you one more, the last one for now, because it's the title of this morning's message. And here we go, hope against hope. Hope against hope. It's a saying that we have in the English language. And how do we understand that? as a saying in the English language. It, it kind of means I'm hoping for something to happen, but the chances are really slim. More like it's a wishful thinking. The odds are not, not really in my favor. Another line I came across which I thought was pretty good, you clinging to a mere tiny ridiculous, and then I put in brackets for fun, impossible possibility. That's how we understand hope against hope. If you're an English teacher in high school, do you remember that English teacher, the one that kind of gave you the chills? They've always got that aura about them. I think some of them are connected to the mafia. They used to really intimidate me. That English teacher, remember her? If she said to you, um, Mr. Jones, she wants to make sure you understand idioms, could you please use the phrase hope against hope in a sentence for me? Hopefully you would answer something like, um, okay, ma'am, um, I left my wallet on a train and, and I have hope against hope that someone's going to return it to me. Or maybe you'd say something like, uh, all right, we as a family had load shedding last night, but we have hope against hope that that's the last time for the year. <laughs> that would be a good answer. Or ma'am, I have hope against hope that I'm going to get a distinction in your class. Well, those are good answers. In other words, wishful thinking, it's probably not going to happen. You're clinging to a mere, ridiculous, tiny, impossible possibility. But was that what the Bible meant. If the saying is from the Bible, what was the Bible saying? I'm not really interested in an English lesson here today. Because if it comes from the Bible, then I want to ask, what did God mean with hope against hope? And that has a huge impact in my life. And maybe sitting there, you would agree with me, if we look around, we sure could do with a bit of hope. There's a lot of hopelessness. Maybe you'd put up your hand and say, yep, I sure could do with a little bit of hope. So let's have a look at this line, hope against hope. I think a good place to start is, all right, where do we find that in the Bible? That's a good question, and it's linked to a, a fantastic story. So we get this line in probably one of the most loved letters written by Paul. He wrote a letter to the, book, uh, to, to the church of Rome, which we now call the book of Romans. And Paul, and of course, all his wisdom and intellect, and uh, he's having this huge debate, as it were. The crux of this book is our salvation is based on faith in God's grace, not in good works, not in being a good person. That was something they were battling with 2,000 years ago. We even battle now with that. And you can see he's using anything and everything he has in his toolbox to drive this point home. And one of the tools that he's using, he refers back to probably the most revered individual in Jewish history, this man by the name of Abraham. 
So just to maybe give you some perspective what that would have been like, if you and I were having a friendly debate or an argument, and I want to make a point, I use an illustration or a line or a quote from the life of Nelson Mandela, you'd be, whoa, that's a good argument. That's good leverage. So that's exactly what he's doing here. So let's parachute in, as it were, into this lovely letter, Romans 4 verse 18, and it says, in hope he, and of course it's talking about Abraham, believed against hope. So that's where we get that statement from in English, hope against hope, that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. I ask them to underline that part because that is so important in that verse and I'll, I'll explain why in a couple of minutes. And what, did he, what had he been told? So shall your offspring be. Okay, so let's just maybe give you the context here quickly. He is jumping back 2,000 years from his time, and he's talking about a story that they would have definitely known about, and most of you have vaguely heard the story, the story of Abraham and Sarah, who are really old. You can go and check us out for yourself in Genesis chapter 17. They're old, like older than Leonard Stone old, okay? You've got to understand, they are, they're super old. And God has given them some incredible promises. And one of them is that you'd be the parents, you'd be the father, not just of a family, but of nations. There's a couple of problems though. Firstly, I just highlighted, they're super old. But added to that, they don't have any kids at all. Even though God said it, there's, there's no kids. Now, out of pure curiosity, I go and Google, in modern times, modern times, what is the oldest person to have had a child? Verifiable fact on record. And in fact, that was just set the other day, the Guinness Book of Records will point this out to you, in 2019. Um, just that you know, it took me about a week to learn this message. It took me about another week just to learn how to say this lady's name, okay? Here we go. Her name is Eremati. Magayama, give or take a vowel, somewhere in that. <laughs> so she sets a record, gives birth, listen to this, to twins at the age of 74. 74 years old. Yes, most of the rumors and the murmuring there was from ladies over 70. <laughs> I can imagine. Like, what? 74. Now, obviously, it was through in vitro and donor eggs, but that's still quite an achievement. And Added to that, it's twins, set in 2019. I just want to point out something to you. Let us add another 16 years to her age. We get the age of Sarah, 90 years old. And Abraham is 99 years old. Paul, in fact, makes a very straight as only Paul can, statement, very funny statement in verse 19, and he's talking about Abraham's body. He says, it was as good as dead. <laughs> take dead and take one step back or one step forward, whichever way you see it, and you have Abraham. And guess what? They have a child together. They have a son together. May I point out, they wouldn't have been in vitro there wouldn't have been donor eggs. There wouldn't have been blue medication. Let's move on very quickly. <laughs> In hope against hope, they were having a child clinging to a mere, tiny, ridiculous, impossible possibility. I could have said to my English teacher, well, uh, Sarah at the age of 90 and Abraham at the age of 99, in hope against hope, were trying to have a child. And she would have said, oh, yep, that's a good answer. But the question is, is that what the Bible was saying? Is that what Paul was saying when he wrote in hope against hope? Definitely not. What was he saying? He was saying this simply, there are two kinds of hope. Two different kinds, and that's why he's using this line, one against the other. It's almost as if he's saying between the lines, let's have a face-off between these two different hopes. In other words, there is a ridiculous hope, but there is also a sensible hope. There is one that is basically wishful thinking, but there is another one with certain expectation. There is one that is probably going to let you down, but there's one that will never 
fail you. There is one that is just surrounded by uncertainty and instability and emotional instability, and there's another one that is certain and brings about emotional stability. And then, as it were, he's saying to you and to me, pick one, choose one. It's one or the other. It's one against the other. And maybe just for simplicity's sake, can we say the one is worldly or human hope? And then he's saying, why don't we rather choose the hope of Abraham? Let's follow that hope. Now, just for a couple of moments together, let us unpack the differences between these two hopes because they obviously have two very different foundations. So let's look at the worldly human hope. What is the foundation to that hope? And I can kind of sum it up quite simply in one word. Let's have a look at that word. Mathematics. The foundation to that hope is in maths. Or another way I could say it, it's in odds. It's in odds. You leave your wallet on that train, there is a mathematical answer. There are some kind of odds to that being returned to you. In fact, there's a vague answer to that question. Can you believe it? I even Googled that. So Mark Rober, I don't know if you've heard of that guy before. He's a NASA scientist and engineer. He resigned from NASA uh, to, to pursue YouTube. And he's a young guy, really dynamic, and my kids love watching his stuff, and secretly so do I, don't tell anyone. But he does all kinds of tests and experiments, and they're phenomenal, and they're entertaining, and he's just trying to expose kids to engineering, get them excited about math. So guess what he does? He decides he wants to know what are the odds of a wallet being returned. So he leaves behind, distributes 200 wallets across the United States of America in 10 of their major cities to find out what are the odds of that wallet being returned. Guess what the answer is? And I thought it was quite surprising. 40%. 40%. But I need to point out two very important points about his experiment. Number one, he didn't put cash in any of those wallets. (laughs) I think that changes things. Another point, this is very important, that experiment was done in the USA, not in the (laughs) RSA. Okay, we we just got (laughs) to... Because that would change the odds. You play the lotto, which you really shouldn't, but I'll leave that up to Leonard to sort out, and you hope to win the jackpot. What are the odds? Latest business research says you've got one in 14 million chance of winning winning that jackpot. Just to maybe put that in perspective, you've got a way better chance of having a car accident on the way to the shop buying the lotto ticket than you do have of winning. And that is a fact. And I carried on reading the research, and I thought this was so, so entertaining. If you want to guarantee yourself a win, fair enough, maybe not the jackpot, just any kind of win, even if it's 200 bucks, you need to spend 49 million rand to guarantee yourself a win. The odds of no more load shedding till the end of the year? <laughs> Rather play the lotto. Okay. <laughs> there will be a mathematical answer to that question, and fair enough, it might be 0.000, but there are odds, so don't lose me here. Our faith, if it's in the human, worldly hope, I mean, our hope is based on maths, on odds. Now, maybe you say, no, Mark, but hang on, that's, with all due respect, you using extreme examples to make your point. And I go, odds one in 14 million. Sometimes I'm hoping for something where the odds are a little better than one in 14 million. In fact, they're kind of stacked in my favor. For example, Mark, you know, I've just finished a degree and I'm hoping in the new year I'm going to get a new job or promotion. It's really looking good. The boss is pretty chuffed. Or, you know, my boyfriend and I have been dating now for two years. I, I really, I, I hope he's going to propose next year. He's giving all the signs. It's really looking great. Or I want to go overseas. I've never been overseas. I've been saving for 10 years, so it's looking good. Those odds are not against me. They're not stacked one in 14 million. Good point. But there's two questions, maybe two things I just want to highlight. Can you guarantee it's going to happen? Can you put your life on the line and say, he's definitely going to propose, or I'm definitely going to get that job, or I'll definitely go overseas? You can't. 
You can't. You say, well, that's a bit unreasonable. Of course we can't guarantee. In fact, the English language has a saying about that too, which is not in the Bible. But the only guarantee in life is death and taxes. So it's a bit unfair to say, can you guarantee? And then I've got another point. Even if it does happen, let's give you the benefit of the doubt that he does propose or you do go overseas. Can you guarantee it will be good beyond your wildest dreams? And that you can't guarantee either. You may get engaged, and next thing, the relationship goes horribly wrong. Or you may land up in that so-called dream job and then discover this is not really what I want to do. Or you may go overseas, and next thing, a hurricane comes through, or Putin decides to invade France. Who knows? (laughs) You can't guarantee it's going to happen, and you can't guarantee it's going to be good. This is why human worldly hope is just surrounded in uncertainty and really has the huge potential to to disappoint. So are you telling me I can't have any of that kind of hope? No, not at all. That will make you a very miserable and depressed kind of individual. But what I am saying this morning, and this is so important, don't lean your life on it. Let us rather lean our lives on the other hope, the one Abraham lent on. What is the foundation of that hope? Because it's definitely not maths. It's definitely not odds. I can kind of sum it up in one word as well. The foundation is this word. Let's take a look. The word. You say, oh, okay, the Bible. No. It's much more than that. You see, when I say the word, it has two very important meanings. One, the spoken word, and two, the living word. Spoken word, living word. Let's look at that first one where I say spoken word. That's why I asked them to underline in that verse, God spoke to Abraham. God had said something to that man. And sometimes you and I think, oh, God only speaks to Bible characters. No. God has spoken to you and to me. And then he made sure that they wrote it down. And then in an incredible, miraculous, beautiful story, made sure through the centuries that it would be preserved and protected and compiled and printed and now even available on your phones for you and me to read at any time, any place, anywhere. Hundreds of promises spoken to you and to me. That's One of the foundations of our hope, he said something to you and to me. Now, somewhere along the line, you've definitely thought this or you've said this. Um, That's a person, that's a lady, that's a gentleman of their word. They said, you know, she said she'd give me the report or he said he would phone or the contractor said they would come. And I really trust them, I, I believe them because they're people of their word. Again, can you guarantee that? No, because life happens. It's human nature we're dealing with. Sometimes there's flat tires and family emergencies, and so you can't rely on that 100% guarantee. So maybe just stick with me here for a second where a being, a particular being, says something to you, says they're going to do something or says they're not going to do something, but this particular being, well, they're not limited. They have no boundaries whatsoever. They're not limited by time. They're not limited by space. They're not limited by a diary. They're not limited by a transport, any means of transport. In fact, they have access to every resource available. In fact, this being is so powerful that if something doesn't exist, it's okay. He just speaks it and speaks it into being. And that particular being cannot distort the truth, cannot exaggerate, cannot lie, and added to that, that being loves you to bits and is 100% committed to you. Do you think you could trust his word? 100% guaranteed. He's given us a whole lot of promises for you and for me. The spoken 
or written word. But then there's the other side, the living word. What is that? Maybe a better question is, who is that? He has a name, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus has several names and several titles. Maybe you think, isn't that a bit strange? No, think about you as a normal human being. You've got a first name. All of us sitting here have got a surname. A number of us here have got a second and some a third and even a fourth name. So you've got, you alone have got several names, and through the years, people have called you different things. There have been nicknames, and some of you have got very long names, so you've been given an abbreviated name, and added to that, you, you've got titles. You're a father, you're a mother, you're a mister, you're a missus, you're a doctor. So you, as a human being, could be called several things. So can Jesus. I loved Johnny's intro. He is the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, and Christmas was all about celebrating Emmanuel, another name of his, God with us. He has another name called the Word, the Word. I want to read to you from the beginning of John. Bible scholars would tell you out of the 66 books in the Bible, a number of them have got incredible introductions, and this is almost in the top three as it were, when it just comes to introduction. Let's just see how John kicks off this gospel. It says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything and was created, and His life, I love this line, His life brought light to everyone. Some of you have got the NLT study Bible. We have it here in the coffee shop, and I have that at home, and I just read a little bit of commentary at the bottom of this introduction, and I just love the way this, this man puts this about this introduction. Let's have it on the screen. John raises the curtain on his gospel with a stunning description of who? Jesus Christ as the Word. The foundation of our hope is what God said and who he is, Jesus Christ. An all-powerful, all-loving, universe-creating, life-breathing, world-sustaining, government-selecting, hair-counting being called Jesus Christ. The same Jesus that leaves his throne of glory and trades it in for a feeding trough and a couple of years later gets pinned to a tree, and a couple of hours later gets placed in a tomb. But no trough, no tree, no tomb had the faintest chance of stopping the Son of God. It's in that person that you and I have hope. The one hope, the foundation is in odds. The other one is in a person. What he has said and who he is. A couple of moments ago, I said to you, if our hope is in the worldly hope, or if you're just, there's instability there, and there's emotional instability. You see, you and I, all of us have an emotional tank. And life, I'm sure you will agree with me, has this way of draining that tank. And sometimes you're sitting and your tank is just totally empty. A couple of weeks ago, my emotional tank was empty because I clicked. I was leaning on the wrong hope. I was hoping he would and I was hoping she wouldn't and I was hoping the outcome of that meeting would go this way. I was drained. And people, being human beings, are going to let us down and ESCOM is going to switch off the lights and that what happens, that tank just gets opened and the emotions just run dry and next thing we find ourselves in self-pity and self-justification and super angry or the doctor's report comes along and it's not great or they start retrenchment process at work and what happens, that tank just starts emptying and next thing I can't sleep at night. Or you're facing temptation just day after day and my emotional tank is just drained and I'm a total sitting 
I'm a total sitting duck. Why? Because I'm leaning on the wrong hope. But when I lean on who God is, Jesus Christ, and what he has said, it just fills that tank. And next thing, if people let me down, it's okay. I return good for evil. I walk in forgiveness. Walking in love, it's not an issue. It becomes easier. And no matter what the doctor says or no, no matter what the accounting records say, I'm leaning on Jesus and who he is and what he said, and I can sleep at night. And the temptations are coming my way. I'm not leaning on myself. That's the last place I should lean or 12 steps or that course. No, I'm leaning on Jesus Christ and I stand strong. And I don't know, some of you here this morning, maybe you're sitting and, and your emotional tank is nice and full. That's great. And I mean that. I'm not being sarcastic. That's awesome. But some of you, I don't know what your story is, but some of you are sitting here and you're saying, that's me, my tank. My tank is empty. Guess what? The God who spoke those stars into being that we just had a look at a couple of moments ago, that God, that Jesus, has spoken to you. And what I want to do, just for a couple of moments this morning, I want to read what he has said to you. I've got a couple of verses, and this is totally up to you. You might want to close your eyes. You maybe want to look up. You maybe just want to put your hands out. That's up to you. But God has spoken to us. Let us hear what he has said. Maybe you're sitting in that chair and you're really feeling lost and lonely. Especially in this December time. What has Jesus said to you? I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, I leave 99 to go and look for you. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Maybe your heart is broken, you're angry, or just really discouraged. What has the creator of the universe said to you? Be still. And no. And it's not saying, hey, shut up. It's saying, shh, 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 shh. I've got this. I'm God. Be still. No, I'm God. I don't crush, crush a bruised reed or snuff out a smoldering wick. In fact, I draw even closer to the brokenhearted. And I will work all things for your good if you love me. In other words, if you allow me. And I've got good plans for you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Maybe you're just tired. Maybe so, Mark, I'm totally exhausted. It feels like I've been run over by a 2022 bus. Has Jesus said anything to you? Yes, he has. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. In fact, let's swap yokes. Give me your heavy one. And you take my light one. And I will strengthen you. And I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. And maybe you're sitting there and your emotional tank is empty because at home, the cupboards are empty. And the car outside the fuel tank is literally empty. Has God said anything to you? Oh, yes, he has. I am your refuge and your strength, your ever-present help in trouble. I feed the birds, I clothe, I clothe the fields. How much more will I do for you, my child? Don't be afraid. Don't worry about for tomorrow, for I am with you even till the end of the age. Trust Jesus. Even when the evidence seems to go against that. Our hope doesn't lie in government, in economics, in education, in people, in family. It doesn't even lie in yourself. 
our hope needs to lean on a person, the Son of God, who has spoken to you. Pastor Derek Leonard's dad used to say, we have a no-so hope, not a hope-so hope. What was he saying? The no-so hope, there's the confidence. There's a 100% guarantee, not a hope-so hope. He was talking about the wishful thinking. He was saying exactly what Paul was saying 2,000 years. One hope against the other. Choose one. Choose one. So this morning, I just want to close off back to that letter that Paul wrote to a church called Rome. And he thought he was only writing that to Rome. I can imagine him standing in heaven, looking down upon you and me, and he's laughing with delight. He said, I didn't realize I was actually writing also to a church in Kempton Park in 2022 and to individuals in those churches. This is God speaking to you and to me. And this prayer is Romans 15 verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. That's where you lean. What's the outcome? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, let's stand. Come, let's pray together. Lord, it's human nature to sometimes lean on the odds, on the mats. Thank you for that incredible line and that there's a far better hope with a far better foundation and that's you thank you for your faithfulness that you've spoken to me you've given us incredible promises for us to take to read to hold on at any time and there's a 100% guarantee father because when we look at who you are your power your glory your love you're never going to let us down Father, help me switch from the one hope to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.